seated. We are going to be in the first chapter of the book of Joel today. 30 points to the first person who finds the book of Joel. It's in the Old Testament. I'll, I'll give you that. It's in the Old Testament, all right? It's a short book, only three uh, chapters. But one of the things we quickly discover about God, and you probably know this already, is God doesn't always do things the way we would expect, right? We would expect God to build a bridge over the Red Sea, not split the sea, right? We would expect God to, to tell us to hate those who hate him and not love those who hate him, right? It's an upside-down kingdom, right? If a kid punches your kid in the, in the nose, it would be expected for you to tell your kid to punch him right back, right? Only harder than he hit you, right? It's unnatural to tell your kid to turn the other cheek and to pray for his bully. When we read the Old Testament, we discover a God who does things that can sometimes seem messed up. We read about what the Bible says God did and what the Bible says God allowed. And it's, I mean, is it surprising when we read the Old Testament, we read the, the, the events of the Old Testament, is it a, a surprising at all? That so many Christians want to run as far away from the Old Testament as possible. <laughs> However, since God is never changing, you have the same issues with God in the flesh, Jesus. Right? Jesus allowed one of his best friends to die only to raise him from the dead three days later. Right? That doesn't make sense. Jesus never once defended himself against allegations being hurled at him by Pilate. That does not make sense. God allowed himself to be crucified and killed. That's not what anyone was expecting. And in fact, to this day, that is a reason that some people use not to worship the one true God. Right? Why would a God allow himself to be killed? It makes no sense. Now, most of the time... The way God handles the, uh, decides to handle the situation doesn't cause us to get angry or resentful or, or cause us to get hurt most of the time. However, when it directly affects us, well, that's a different story, right? When we need God to do something, we often preemptively decide exactly how he should do it. And so when he doesn't do that, we don't understand. I mean, surely God, the creator of all things, knows that our plan is better than anything he could ever hope to come up with. When we face bad times, when we face uncertain times, we experience pain. That's when what God does in response matters the most to us. In front of our house. There's a little patio space. It's actually right out in front of the master bedroom. And whoever lived there before us had planted some beautiful roses in the flower bed at the end of the patio. They're absolutely gorgeous. And I remember the first time Liam wanted to cut them after we moved in, wanted to trim them. And like I said, they were beautiful, right? And I said, why would you cut them? They're absolutely perfect the way they're. I like them. They're blooming. They're gorgeous. Why would you trim them? I was terrified, right? My wife can do anything she wants to do. And for some reason, I still get terrified when she wants to do something. But she wants to cut them. I was terrified that she was going to ruin these beautiful roses. But again, she proved me wrong. The roses came back, and they were gorgeous. See, the pruning was necessary. Without the, the cutting off, of what I thought was beautiful, I would have never gotten to enjoy the new buds blooming the next season. One of the most uncomfortable truths of the Christian faith is that one must die in order to live. Destruction is necessary, whether we like it or not. And so look in Joel chapter 1, verse 4 verses says this, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel, hear this, you elders, 
Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Stop there. There's a very good chance that many of you have never read the book of Joel. Is anyone brave enough to admit they never read the book of Joel? It's okay. All right, it's fine. It's fine. It's one of those Old Testament books which is very easy to overlook, right? It's only three chapters long. And that means, that means it's, it's, uh, and it's also a uh, prophetic book, right? It's one of those prophetic books, which means it's not always easy to understand and figure out how it applies to our life today. But I want you to hear me. It does. It does. And it breaks my heart that more and more Christians dismiss it. See, people want to, to, to split God in half. There's the God of the Old Testament, and then there's Jesus, right? No, it's the same God. But people run from the Old Testament because they can't understand the wrath of God. Right? They, they see the wrath of God as something that only a mean or vain, vindictive God would express. For me, I see God's wrath as an act of mercy. Hear that. I see God's wrath as an act of mercy. Why? Because I allow the whole I allow the New Testament to bring understanding to the Old Testament and vice versa. I read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ and him crucified. But if you struggle with God's wrath, if that's been a struggle of yours throughout the years, I'm so glad you're here. And my hope and my prayer today is that you will leave here with a completely different understanding and a completely different appreciation for God's wrath. Instead of running from it, our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ is to try to understand it and believe it even if we don't understand it. And so Joel is one of the many Old Testament prophets sounding the alarm for the Jewish people. Joel is in the group that we call the minor prophets. That's not because they aren't important. It's simply because we don't have as much of their writings, assuming they wrote anything else than what we have. Now, the original, uh, the 12, the 12 uh, minor prophets were originally bundled together. And they were called the 12, right? And Joel was number two in the 12. But eventually the books were broken up in the Bible. The book of Joel is a little different than some of the other prophetic books. Like the other prophets, Joel is warning the people that their sins will bring the wrath of God upon them. However, unlike the prophets that came before him, he never mentions what the exact sins are. Now, the reason for that, we believe, is because it seems clear if you read the book of Joel that he has read the scriptures. He had read the earlier prophets, and so Joel didn't need to go into detail. He assumed that those who were hearing his words or reading his words would have also heard or read the words of the other prophets. But even though he doesn't mention specific sins, the warnings are the same. Repent or be destroyed. There's a possibility that Joel was a student of the prophet Elisha. It was, and the book was written during a time when a lot of things had gone wrong for Israel. They had some really bad leaders. And they had just suffered a national plague, which I'll tell you about in a minute. There was, there was civil unrest and economic problems. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And like the people in Joel's day, we too desperately need to hear and receive these words. Now, I'll admit, Joel does not begin on a high note, right? The very first thing he talks about is a downer. And while there are people who like reading and watching depressing books and movies, most people want entertainment that starts happy and just gets happier, right? However, I want you to understand, God's word is not meant to entertain you. It's meant to change you. If you're looking for entertainment, go watch a movie. If you're looking for change, 
read the word. You look at the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus Christ on the cross, then these first few verses are ultimately not about God's wrath, but about God's mercy. See, at first blush, the, the passage looks like a, a completely depressing passage. I promise you, this passage is not in any children's picture Bible. That doesn't upset me. I understand why it wouldn't be in there, right? But it does speak to the fact that we are reading this story at bedtime, right? You tuck your kid in at night and then you sit there on the edge of the bed and tell your children and their children and their children that nothing's going to be left once God has his way. These big, ugly bugs are going to come and destroy everything. And if they miss anything, then more bugs are going to come. And then more bugs. And then more bugs. Sweet dreams. I promise you, you're, you're not sleeping alone that night, right? But here is the upside-down kingdom reading of this passage. While it may not seem obvious, I believe we are meant to love locusts. You may remember that, that locusts were one of the plagues God sent to help free the Jewish people from captivity. And I think we can all agree that plagues are bad, right? I don't know anyone who thought 2020 was one of the best years yet, right? We all hated 2020. It was a miserable time. And if you don't know anything about locusts, they can absolutely destroy a land. They can turn a beautiful field of crops into a wasteland. During the great locust swarms in the past, the locusts left behind absolutely or absolute devastation. Crops, livestock, and people have died because of locust swarms. And so it's not crazy to balk at the idea of loving locusts, right? Locusts equal destruction and death and loss. Why would we love that? It does seem crazy. But let me walk you through my, my thinking. I'm not saying that if my livelihood uh, depended on growing crops and raising livestock, that I would love to see a swarm of locusts headed my way. I'm not saying that, right? They're devastated. There's no denying it. However, what if there's another way to look at it? What if we could learn to love locusts? Not the pain they cause, but what they leave behind. And I'm not talking about the destruction. The prophet Joel was using this locust plague as both an illustration and as a warning. The illustration aspect has to do with the effect sin has on our lives, right? Sin, like locusts, will continue to destroy us as long as the sin sticks around, right? You think looking at pornography only occasionally won't end your marriage, but any sin that you allow into your life has the potential to steal, kill, and destroy. Oh, I know you think that a little can't hurt. But hear me, you wouldn't let your child think like that when it comes to fire, right? I mean, sure, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, sure, she's only three years old, but it's just a little fire. You would never do that. And yet you live your life like that's your motto. Uh, motto. A little bit can't hurt. The problem is, a little is often followed by a little more, and a little more, and a little more. And what the first little bit didn't destroy, the next little bit will do its best to finish the job. And if that little bit can't, then the next little bit will have a go at it. See, no little bit likes to be alone. They want, it, they want the whole little bit family to get together and destroy you. Notice the locusts came in waves and ate what the wave in front of them left. Locusts like sin will leave behind a wasteland. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. That is just the natural outcome of sin and locusts. Devastation. And so Joel is using the locusts as an illustration, but he's also using it as a warning. Joel is trying to communicate to those in Jerusalem that the Lord's judgment is coming and will be more destructive than any swarm of locusts could hope to be. Joel is warning the people that God is going to send the whole Babylonian army to end to destroy them like a horde of locusts. 
when you're in school, you probably learned about active versus passive uh, voice, right? If you ever had to write a paper, then you probably heard about active voice and passive voice. I'll give you an example. Active voice would be, I want ice cream, right? It is enough for debate, it's pretty clear. I want ice cream. Passive voice would be, ice cream is wanted by me now, right? Other than being a weirdo for talking like that, it's just more detached, right? It's also longer and a bit awkward. And so in these verses in Joel, we actually see something similar. Theologians call it the passive and active dimensions of the wrath of God and how they work together. Pastor J.D. Greer puts it well. He writes, passive wrath of God equals God allowing us to suffer the natural consequences of our sin. Active wrath of God is the lightning bolt of judgment from heaven. But here's where we need to get our heads. God's active wrath, the lightning bolt in he of, from heaven, is usually just an extension of, an affirmation of, the passive wrath. In his wrath, God affirms and extends what we have chosen for ourselves. The story of Adam and Eve is a great example. You know the story, so we're not going to read it. But God creates paradise, and then he, he puts Adam and Eve in paradise to live happily ever after. Now, that's not meant to make it sound like a, a fairy tale. It's not, but that's kind of the life God wanted for us, right? He wanted us to live in paradise because that was how he was able to show his love to us the most, right? A perfect world for a perfect love, but Adam and Eve messed it up. And God had to kick them out and ban them from reentering. However, I, the details of that story matter. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, they knew it. But what did they do? They immediately hid themselves because they were ashamed. They hid from God. They separated. They separated themselves from God and felt the horribleness of that. That's the passive wrath of God. They felt the result of their sin. Then God shows up. They admit what they did. And without hesitation, he kicked them out of the garden. That's the active wrath of God. See, God did not destroy the bond he had between Adam and Eve. And in fact, Adam and Eve aren't even fully to blame. Yes, it was their choice. And, and they have to own that. But ultimately, what destroyed the bond between God and man was sin. And when the Christian understands and embraces that truth, a life unlike any other is possible. When we understand that sin destroys and not God, then we're able to see any earthly experiences of God's judgment, like plagues of locusts, as an expression of God's mercy. When we understand that sin destroys, then we see any experience of the painful consequences of that as God, in his mercy, trying to wake us up before it's too late. To quote another pastor, he's not trying to pay you back, but bring you back. I remember when I was a kid, my mother would tell me not to stick a paper clip in a light socket. And my dad would tell her to let me do it. And he would say, he'll only do it once. And I don't think I ever did stick a paper clip in a light socket. However, I do remember hearing he'll only do it once more than once. So I'm not sure if I did. Um, but that's what, he always, that's what he always said. Just do it. He'll do it once. He'll, he'll experience the, the pain, right? The electrocution of it. And assuming he survives it, he'll learn a lesson, right? That was my uh, uh, growing up years. Uh, but it's easy to see God in the same way, right? It's easy to see God like my father in that story. Oh, just let him do it, right? He'll learn his lesson. That's not what God's doing. The reality is, from the moment you are born, God wants nothing more than to keep you safe and away from harm. However, as we talked about before, the choice to obey God or not is required if we are to believe God is a God of love. And so God allows the effects of sin to play out because if God is a God of love, he must allow us not to choose him. So God allows the effects of sin to play out. Not to hurt us, 
but to let us see where sin is taking us before it's too late. Some of you know what it's like to face a swarm of locusts, right? You're trying to save your marriage, but new problems are, are popping up. You're trying to save money, but God keeps letting stuff break down. You're trying everything you can to uh, you think of to be happy but wouldn't know happiness if it hit you upside the head you're trying to straighten up your life and something just keeps popping up to trip you up my wife and I could write a book about being here where we're trying to do the right thing and things just keep coming keep coming keep coming I always refer to those times as uh, the money pit times of life you remember the movie, The Money Pit, with Tom Hanks and Shelley Long? By the way, I rewatched that a few months back. Meh. <laughs> it wasn't as good as I remembered. <laughs> but the whole movie is about a couple buying this beautiful mansion, only to discover that everything that could be wrong with the house is wrong, right? It's just one thing after another. It's a money pit. They just keep pouring money into it. Can you relate to that in your life, right? It's just one thing after another. Nothing seems to be working. If you're there today, I want to ask you. I want you to ask yourself a question: Is God trying to wake me up? Is God trying to wake me up? As Christians, we believe in persevering through difficult times. However, that does not mean we just keep doing what we're doing until it doesn't hurt anymore. So many Christians, when they are facing a crisis, will think it has to do with this thing over here, when in fact God is trying to fix something much, much. Deeper, And so the Christian is only focused on the symptoms and not the cause. Truth is, I don't know anything about locusts. I grew up in Alfred and Johns Creek. I didn't see many locusts. I couldn't even begin to tell you how to keep them from destroying your crops. But if you gave me some time, I could probably come up with a few ways to keep them off your crop. Some ideas that I think might work. Maybe we create a poison, right, that we can spray that kills uh, all the, the, the eggs, right? Maybe we create uh, some kind of net that, that will keep them away, or, or we build some type of enclosure that covers all the crops and all the land, right? I, I don't know. I mean, any of them will work, but we could try them. Or we could realize that God has more locusts then we have solutions. My brother Ray was a very strong-willed person. He was going to do what he wanted to do. And if he got in trouble, then so be it. I couldn't imagine the challenge he was uh, to my parents at times. But my parents knew they had a choice. They could either chain Ray to his bed or teach him the will of God and then let him make his choices and then live with those choices. My dad told us all the time, if you ever get arrested, be prepared to spend the night in jail. Now, your dad may have said the same thing to you, but my dad meant it, right? I knew my dad meant it. See, the struggle you're in is real. And I know you would love to get out of it. But what if some of the struggle has more to do with you and less to do with God? Why were there four waves of locusts? Because there was still something to eat. Are you beginning to see it? What would have happened if after the first wave of locusts, the people went out and cut down anything that was left to make sure no other locusts showed up? But that's not what they did. And to be honest with you, I don't think that's what most of us would do. They probably thought that after the first wave, the, God had made his point. All right? He, he cut them all down. Yeah, there's little stumps there, but he made his point. But here's the problem. It doesn't matter what they or we think. It only matters what God requires. And God will allow the world to bring us to our knees so that we can discover and accept what God requires. And where is it that you accept what God requires? At the end of yourself. He is either Lord of all or not Lord 
at all. And those areas that are keeping him from being all that he deserves to be are going to continuously bring struggles into you, your life until you realize it and remove them. C.S. Lewis compares it to going to God because you realize your house is broken down and you need God to fix it. And at first, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You, you knew those jobs needed doing, and so you were not surprised. But then he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abdominally and does not seem to make any sense to you. And you wonder, what on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Erecting a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. I know you love your little house with its shag carpeting. Yeah. I know you think wallpaper should be on every wall and ceiling. I know you're happy where you are, but Jesus has so much more for you. But he can't just come in and rip up the carpet. He can't just uh, rip down the wallpaper and remove a wall or two. No, in order to give us what he has for us, he has to tear us down to the ground. We don't like to hear that. See, so many people say he has to tear us down to our foundation. That's not right. See, we think that God is going to build the life he has for us on the foundation that we built. That church is called arrogance. Do you remember the parable about the wise and foolish builder? It goes like this. There were three little pigs. No, that's not it. I'm sorry. Um, some of y'all. Okay. It's in the seventh chapter of Matthew. And I'll just read it quickly. It's not going to be on the screen. But it's Jesus uh, telling this parable. It says, Therefore, everyone who hears the, these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his, rock, his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. See, the parable is about two competing foundations. The parable is not about the foolish builder discovering his mistake and then trying to shove some rocks under his foundation to sure it up. No, it's, it's, it's about two totally different foundations. Jesus wants to bring you to the end of you. He wants to rip up your foundation and lay a new one. And unfortunately, that's going to hurt a lot of the time. But church, that's not his fault. That's our fault. It's like what C.S. Lewis said, in the end, we either say to God, thy will be done, or he says to us, thy will be done. Let that sink in. In the end, we either say to God, thy will be done, or God says to us, thy will be done. I can't say why you're struggling. But what if it's because the first and second and third wave of locusts didn't do the job? What if the link and length and severity of the struggle is a you problem and not a Jesus problem? I know you don't want to hear it, right? We want Jesus to fix what we tell him to fix and nothing more. We want Jesus to listen to us. We want Jesus to the servant God to become Jesus, the subordinate God. And when we do that, we are not worshiping Jesus. We are worshiping a shadow of ourselves. And as long as we worship our own shadow, the locusts are going to keep coming. And that isn't God torturing you. That's God begging you and begging 
begging you and begging you to surrender, to surrender everything, not just the tops of the crops, but the very roots of the crops, not just the carpet, but the entire house and the foundation. Church, the God of all creation is greater than the God of your creation. And he loves you more than you will ever know. And when we realize that and accept that and allow that to change our lives, then at the very first sight of locust, we can turn to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, what is it you want to show me? What needs to be removed from my life that will get me to the greater you have for me? Right? It may be something small like actually coming to church every single Sunday or reading the Bible during the week. Or it might be something earth-shattering like quitting your job or telling your partner or your spouse that it has to end. But I want you to hear me. What is behind the locust is something you can't imagine. It's called his will. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It is everything everyone has ever told me it is and a billion times more. I did not enjoy the locusts at first. In fact, I often got really mad at God because of the locusts. Not anymore. Not anymore. Now I thank God for the locusts. Yeah, they might bring some pain. They're also bringing his will. And I will take that every single moment of every single day. Are there locusts in your life? That thing that you, you know shouldn't be there. That habit, that relationship, that routine, that job, that thought life, that behavior. If you're thinking of anything right now, that is like the locust showing up and beginning to chow down like it's the golden corral. And maybe you've been in this very moment before, right? Maybe you know those locusts have shown up before and you fall on your hand on them and they've shown up again because you didn't uh, get rid of it all. Some of it remained. And so you've been trying to be a good little Christian even though you're allowing sinful weeds to grow in you. And so the locusts have come back. And so what happens now is up to you. The reality is you can walk out of here today and do absolutely nothing different. Again, that's your choice. But if you know right now that locusts have shown up, you know Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to stir within you a feeling of contrition. You're, you're seeing, maybe for the first time, the root of what is bringing pain and suffering into your life. And the question is, are you ready to rip it out? The locusts are an act of God's mercy because they bring God's will with them. So I don't hate them anymore. I love them. Simply because they prove to me my God loves me. Do you need to rip out some roots? Are you ready to begin loving locusts? Every week I have a response for you. Whether it's come to the altar, come to the pray, or it's a card I give you. I gotta be honest, I wrestled this week with a response. As always, the pillows are available to you at the end of the service or at, you know, after the sermon, you come down and pray. But frankly, I don't know how to end this one. I don't know how to end this one. Except to ask the question, have the locusts shown up? Have the locusts shown up in your life? You know right now if they have. Some of you are looking at me going, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm good. Fine. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, yes. I'm on my third wave. You know. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you ready? Are you tired? Are you just tired? Tired of the struggle? 
Tired of the struggle. First wave comes in, you go back outside, you try to pick up the pieces. Okay, let's get. And they come back. Okay, pick up the pieces. And they come back. Stop picking up the pieces. Dig it out. So, what's the response? That's up to you. Pillows are open. I'm down front if you want to talk. You want to talk after church. You want to go outside and walk and pray. You want to just leave in a huff. The response is yours. But I beg of you to respond. To respond to the Lord's call. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I know I have had so many fields in my life that you have sent locusts in to destroy. Lord, I know what it's like to see a third and fourth and fifth and sixth wave of locusts. Unfortunately, my family knows what it feels like and looks like. Every wave, Lord, all it did was destroy. I'm trying to get my attention, Lord, forgive me for all those years I didn't listen. And so, Lord, my heart is heavy today for everyone in this room who are struggling, who are just trying to, 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 to make things work when you're saying, no, 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 let me just rip it all out and start anew. Lord, you're not calling us to flip over a new leaf. You're calling us to a new life. Lord, in order for us to have a new life, we have to die first. We have to rip up the foundations that we loved. We have to rip up the plants that we loved if they're not according to your will. And so, Lord, right now, Holy Spirit, talk to us, challenge us, lay on our hearts what we need to do today. And then, Lord, give us the courage and the humility to actually do it. To actually do it, Lord. I know it can be frightening. It can be, it can be scary to, 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 to come down front and to kneel or to come talk to a pastor or whatever. But, Lord, today, do not let us leave here without responding to you. I pray this all in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen.